So in the interest of time, I'm going to go very fast. <laughs> so uh, this slide represents one of the major conflicts in the world. You know, the, the tremendous disparity in income and wealth inequality in the world, you know, wealth and income inequality in the world. And, uh, you know, I, this paper is titled An Analysis of Narendra Modi's Statecraft in the Light of Kautilya's Arthashastra. Now, interestingly, the morning consult polls, which keeps polling every few weeks, as to who is the most popular world leader, most popular world leader, Narendra Modi gets an approval rating of 78% in favor and 17% disapproval. It's by far the highest approval rating in the whole world. And it has been in this condition, more or less, for more than five years now, unchanged, right? Lots of people, leaders have come and gone. He, in fact, uh, did not do so well in the last elections as he perhaps anticipated. But still, if you go and check this particular poll today morning, you will see that his approval rating is still up there. Okay, so the question is why? You now, what principles of leadership have enabled Narendra Modi to become the world's most popular world leader for more than five years running? It's an interesting question because you know it's, people can't answer that question. The only thing they can come up with, I mean, I'm talking about the world when confronting this as a fact. The only thing they come up with is something is wrong, you know, either he's wrong, the Hindus are wrong, something is wrong, how can he be the most popular? And of course, they want to destabilize India, as you all probably know. Now, in the Arthashastra, if you kind of let go of Western interpretations, right, there is a foundation framework called Saptanga. Now, in yoga, you have all heard of Ashtanga Yoga. This is in the Arthashastra, there is this Saptanga, the seven prakritis. Okay, so this is Mitra and Leibig in a book written in 2016 saying, in the Arthashastra, Kautilya develops a holistic, substantive idea of state power or state capacity for which there is no precedent. The Saptanga theory is one of Kautilya's truly outstanding theoretical achievements. Okay, this is Mitra and Leibig talking in 2016. But how many of you have heard of the Saptanga theory? Raise your hands if you have heard of the Saptanga theory. Very few people, right? Couple of people here and there, okay? How many of you have heard of Ashtanga Yoga? Everybody's heard of Ashtanga Yoga, <laughs> right? So, you know, this Saptanga theory, you know, centers on seven sort of anchor points of state capacity. They are listed here. The ruler king, Swamin, the ministers, Amatya, the people, Janapada, Fort Fortress, Durga, Kosha, the treasury, Danda, the army, military, Mitra, the allied friend. And this is a phenomenal accomplishment, this theoretical framework. So, the Arthashastra is a text on Raja Dharma and it is continuous with the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Ramayana was articulated Raja Dharma in the which Yuga was that? Tretha Yuga. The Mahabharata articulates Raja Dharma in the Dwapara Yuga. Arthashastra articulates Raja Dharma in the Kali Yuga. So they are different based on the Yuga, the, 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 the uh, characteristics of the Yuga. But there is a continuity across the texts. So Raja Dharma in the Artha Shastra is divided into broadly three categories. Protection and expansion of the kingdom. Rakshana. Administering the state to expand the treasury. Palana. Ensuring the overall welfare of the people. Yoga Kshema. And under these there are numerous topics that Artha Shastra deals with. You know, you can't go into everything but it's it's encyclopedic in its scope of topics that the Arthashastra deals with. And if you read the Arthashastra, the overwhelming sense that you get is that it is talking about a state which is well-run, prosperous, bustling with economic activity. 
Okay, and that's a quote from Ellen Rangarajan, who wrote a book on Arthashastra. Now, Matsya Nyaya. Arthashastra uses a term called Matsya Nyaya. What is Matsya Nyaya? Well, the big fish will eat the small fish. That's the law. Law of the jungle, as they call it in the West. In Sanskrit, it's called Matsya Nyaya. And, of course, the only, only response to the problem of the big fish is for the small fish to get organized. Okay? And that's the Western solution. And of course, the, the Hindu solution is that for many, many different schools of fish to coexist, right? The central problem is one of ensuring that the big fish don't eat up the small fish. Capitalism, socialism, communism are all attempts to solve this problem. They fall short. The realist recognition of the challenge of mitigating matsya nyaya within the scope of the state, the nation state, as well as beyond it, is one of the intellectual breakthroughs of the Arthashastra. This is very critical, okay? We don't, we don't understand it in those terms. And for me, recognizing this was a tremendous, I mean, literally a tremendous breakthrough, intellectual breakthrough for me, that this is what he's doing in the Arthashastra. The Saptanga theory in action, Swamin, Amatya, Janapada, Durga, Kosha, Danda, Mitra. These are the seven constituents of state capacity, Saptanga. What does it mean? Well, it means the Swamin is the ruler, the one at the heart of it. He matters. The ruler matters. More than anything else, the ruler matters. <laughs> Amatya is a, an excellent council of ministers. Janapada, development works, welfare works, welfare programs, working in a relatively corruption-free environment to serve the people, the service of the people, Janapada. Durga, the fortified cities, the capital, the state capitals, the key cities and towns, fortified borders, protected treasury, banks, you know, that's, that's what the Durga means, the fortification of the nation. Kosha, the expanding economy, the treasury, foreign exchange reserves, efficient tax collection architecture, and so on. Arthashastra is incredibly detailed in discussing tax collection uh, matters. Danda is maintenance of law and order, army, navy, air force, intelligence, counterintelligence, defense infrastructure, and capabilities. And Mitra is a network of alliances, international relationships, Consistent diplomatic engagement across the world. This is Saptanga, the seven dimensions of state capacity and power. And this is the intellectual breakthrough of the Arthashastra. On expanding states' power and capacity. Now, I've got several quotations from the Arthashastra in the next few slides. Okay, I'm not going to read them. They're all in the paper. So, you, you know, people who want to get to know the, these, you should read the paper. I'll read one or two of them. In the happiness of his subjects lies the king's happiness. In their welfare is welfare. Their welfare, his welfare. He shall not consider as good only that which pleases him, but that which is a treat that is beneficial to him, whatever pleases his subjects. I mean, this is sort of the, the central mantra of the Arthashastra, which is Raja Dharma, the mantra of Raja Dharma. And of course, the articulation of Saptanga. And when the king has the Processes the excellences required of the king that uh, David Dattaji articulated, then the other six constituents of state capacity can be developed into, for the, into their own excellences. The king is the most critical component of the state. On wealth creation, there is, I mean, tomes and tomes of quotations and verses of the Arthashastra on wealth creation. You know, when Arthashastra prioritizes Artha over Dharma, which he does. You, we must understand he's not, Chanaka is not talking to you and me as the ordinary human being. He's talking to the king. And that's different. You know, the Arthashastra is addressed to the king, the ruler. For the ruler, Artha is, takes a precedence over Dharma. Through Artha, he accomplishes, he or she accomplishes Dharma. It is often a matter of confusion. All state activities depend first upon the treasury. Therefore, a king shall devote his best attention to the treasury. And of course, many quotations around what happens if you don't have a good treasury, and how to go about building the treasury. 
expand its economy. So taxation, how to expand the treasury without overtaxing the subjects. Magnificent treatise in the Arthashastra, creating the right balance between taxation and expansion of the treasury. So several verses from the Arthashastra on the source of the treasury. To expand the treasury, the state must expand its tra taxation regime. Okay, it's simple. You have to tax. Otherwise, the state has no income. But a sophisticated taxation system must also be just. You cannot overtax. Okay, so what all can you tax? It goes on and on. But a taxation regime must be just so as to not to impoverish the people. So this is where the problem is. The problem, what Arthashastra says was a taxation regime, appropriate, a dharmic taxation regime. What happened under Muslim rulers of India and what happened under the British rule in India is a stark contrast. And this needs to be more significantly articulated and elaborated. <laughs> the welfare state. Now, Arthashastra, I mean, Arthashastra can be, cannot be more articulate about you know, safeguarding the welfare of the poor and the downtrodden and the unfortunate people. So he, there's lots and lots of verses on how the king should maintain. Wealth should be redistributed to the weaker sections during calamities. And then managing corruption. My God, it's unbelievable. When you read the Arthashastra on how much he goes on and on about the problem of corruption and how to mitigate it, how to manage it, how to monitor it, how to contain it, he might as well be talking about governments today. Right? And that's the dimension of Arthashastra's contemporary relevance. This is it's impossible not to taste honey or poison. That one may find at the tip of one's tongue, so it is impossible. So it is impossible for one dealing with government funds not to taste a little bit of the king's <laughs> what is due to the king. Okay. And he goes on and on about corruption and how to manage it, how to mitigate it. The seeds of the contemporary enforcement directorate and investigation agencies. Can be found in that show. How many minutes? Two minutes? Three minutes. All right. So now, you know, very briefly, Narendra Modi statecraft. From 2014 to 2024, 10 years, you look at economic growth, it went from about 2 trillion to nearly 4 trillion. Okay, it's about 193% growth in the GDP of the country. But that's not that exciting in and of itself. You put the tax revenue growth in the same period, it went from $142 billion to $430 billion, which is 300%. So there is a differential growth in tax collections relative to expansion of the economy. But that's the key. This is what Chanakya is talking about in the Arthashastra. How do you expand your tax collection without imposing an extra burden on the, on the Janapada, the community, the people? So this is all well sourced, okay, this data. So in Modi's manifestation, there are all these plans, make in India, skill in India, skill India, startup India, Gati Shakti, infrastructure, roads, rail, all of that stimulate economic growth. But on the other hand, there's also the welfare. You know, so many Pradhan Mantri Yojanas, all of this, right? This is just a sample. I mean, there are many, many, many more that can be listed here. Sorry? Huh? No, I was just joking. So okay. he, he even use your name in one of your... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this digital public infrastructure, there is digital India, digital India, which has resulted in digital transaction growth from 100 million in 2017 to 83.75 billion in 2023, 83,750 percent. I mean, it is grossly underestimated what their accomplishment really means in India. And that's the source of the Differential growth in tax collection. But under Jandan Yojana, 523 million people have opened bank accounts through direct benefit transfer. More than $400 billion in financial assistance has been delivered through various programs, 300 plus welfare programs. And he's removed the leakage of nearly 85% of the welfare funds through corruption to mid, mid level, you know, mid, middle managers, which was the norm with the previous administrations. 
And my contention is that's one of the sources of his popularity. Conclusion. There is a tremendous correlation between what the theoretical framework of Arthashastra, of what Chanakya is saying in the Arthashastra, and what Narendra Modi is doing as Prime Minister of India. And he's transcended the classic left-right divide, even though the attack is coming from the same, within the same divide. And nearly corruption-free execution, of course, you know, people will argue to, to varying, varying levels uh, with that. And of course, fundamentally undergirded by the Seva Bhava from his RSS upbringing, this is a source of his immense popularity. Chanakya's Arthashastra is an encyclopedic work on political economics that is underutilized and underappreciated. Okay, we don't study it enough, we don't understand it enough, and it's kind of lost in cliches of Machiavellian and this and that, which is, does not do justice to the text. Narendra Modi, in some sense, exemplifies the Vijig issue of, the Ch of Chanakya, aspires to be a Chakravarti in India. The systematic study of the Arthashastra with Modi's time as a Prime Minister of India is a, as a case study is a very promising project that must be institutionalized. I believe that there is much to be studied, learned, institutionalized, and even disseminated. So that is uh, my, my paper. And I'll just say one last thing, okay? The Raja Dharma essentially is managing the tremendous tensions and oppositions that exists within a society. And, and Chanakya's overwhelming kind of uh, intellect, 